Well, good morning, everyone. I want you to know I'm really excited about the project that uh, Pastor Brad has shared with us this morning. It is an absolute joy to see this building being used for ministry every day of the week. And the fact that there has been this remarkable growth in our student ministry is surely the greatest joy to all of our hearts and uh, something for which we deeply, deeply thank God. Karen and I will certainly be supporting this project through our giving, and I hope that as the Lord enables you, you will want joyfully to do the same. Now, please open your Bible at Matthew in chapter 17, which has been uh, read uh, to us. And uh, when you look at this story, remarkable story, at first, you might think, boy, this seems a long way from my experience. But I want us to see today that God speaks to us directly through this story, and in particular, gives direction for what we are to do when the way ahead of us is hard. And the reason I say that is the context of this story. Remember last week that we uh, saw how Jesus told the disciples that he was going to suffer, be rejected, be killed, and on the third day rise again. And Peter hated the thought of that. He rebuked Jesus, and he would have gone on rebuking Jesus if Jesus hadn't rebuked him. The way ahead was hard. And the next story that comes in the gospel is this story. And so, what we are to understand here is that we are learning something about what we are to do when the way ahead of us is hard, when it's hard to follow Jesus. I want us to see four things from this remarkable story today. When the way ahead of you is hard, look at the glory of Jesus, rejoice in the work of Jesus, rest in the sufficiency of Jesus, and listen to the words of Jesus. First then, when the way ahead of you is hard, look at the glory of Jesus. And we read in verse 2 that Jesus was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Now, uh, this word transfigured here is the word uh, metamorpho from which we get our word metamorphosis. Uh, in other words, there was a transformation, not just in the appearance of Jesus, but in his very form. Jesus is the Lord of glory. But when he came into the world, his glory was veiled. A baby lying in the manger, a carpenter, working in the shop. But you remember that as he began his ministry, there were little glimpses of his glory that kept breaking out. I mean, he turned water into wine. He fed 5,000 people. When he calmed the storm, the disciples said, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? So, there were these breakings out of his glory in his ministry. But here on the mountain of transfiguration, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ is wonderfully revealed to his disciples. So, John, who was there on the top of the mountain, says at the beginning of his gospel, we have seen his glory. And of course, he's referring there particularly to what happened on the mountain of transfiguration. And one day, we will see the glory of Jesus too. Now, Matthew records what this looked like. His face shone like the sun. Now, when you hear about a shining face, you might think about a story in the Old Testament. You remember when Moses went up the mountain and he was there for 40 days receiving the law of God, and after 40 days in the presence of God, when Moses came down the mountain, his face was shining. It was as if something of the glory of the Lord rubbed off on him as he lingered in the presence of God, which, by the way, points us to something very wonderful. There is a brightness 
about a person who spends time in the presence of God. You know, it says in Psalm 34, those who look to him are radiant and their faces are never covered in shame. But remember, the radiance of those who look to him, it doesn't come from within us. It rubs off on us, as it were, from being in the presence of our glorious Lord. And that's what happened to Moses. And of course, that's what, why when he came down the mountain, the bright shining on his face started to fade away because it wasn't intrinsic to him. It was something that came upon him as he lingered in the presence of the Lord. So what I want you to notice is that what happens here in this story is very different because this radiance doesn't come to Jesus this radiance comes from Jesus. It just bursts out from him. He was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun. Now, this is clearly one of the most dramatic stories in all of the Gospels. And I want, as best we can, for us to try and picture what this was actually like from what we're told here in the Bible. And one thing that has helped me in terms of picturing this is, to, um, is a suggestion made by, by one scholar that it is quite likely that the transfiguration actually happened at night. And there are several reasons for, for thinking that this may be the case. First, uh, Luke tells us in his account that Jesus went up the mountain to pray. And we know, of course, of other occasions where Jesus went up a mountain to pray at night. And if this is indeed the case, then what happened here, of course, would have been in some ways similar to what happened on the night when Jesus was born. You remember, there were shepherds out in the fields and they were keeping watch over their flocks by night. And suddenly, you remember, the night sky was filled with this radiant light. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and then Luke records, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Now, another reason for thinking that this may have happened at night, just to get this picture in your mind, is that Luke tells us that Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. Now, it could be, of course, simply that they were heavy with sleep because they were pretty exhausted having climbed up the mountain. But I suspect that what happened here was that they had climbed up the mountain during the day and the darkness had now fallen, that they were exhausted and it was also late. In other words, what happened here was very similar to what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane, where again, it was late at night and the disciples' eyes are heavy and they fall asleep. Now try and get the picture. So Peter staggers up to the top of the mountain and he's pretty exhausted when he gets there. The sun's going down, and Peter lies down flat on his back and falls fast asleep. And then he's wakened, startled by a glorious light piercing through the darkness that is around him. It's so bright he can hardly open his eyes. But as he does, he realizes that the light and the brightness, it's not coming from the moon or the stars, it's not coming from the sun, it's coming from Jesus himself. Now, how does this story then speak to us today? Well, remember, Jesus had just told his disciples that he must suffer, that he must be rejected, and that he was going to be killed. In just a few days, John who was on the top of the mountain, would actually see the face of Jesus, beaten, bloodied, so disfigured that it wasn't even recognizable as a human face. And after six hours of hanging on a cross, John would see the light in Jesus' eye go out. 
as he entered into death. These disciples need to know that this is not the end for Jesus. And so just a few days before he goes to the cross on the Mount of Transfiguration, he gives them a glimpse of his glory. See, that's the thing we need when the way ahead of us is hard. Right now, the Lord Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father in the glory of heaven. Suffering and death were not the end for Jesus. And the hard and painful path that God may lead you on, whatever suffering that involves, will not be the end for you either. When the way ahead is hard, look at the glory of Jesus. Second, when the way ahead of you is hard, rejoice in the work of Jesus. Notice it says in verse 3, and behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. So again, keep in mind, Jesus is preparing to endure the agonies of the cross. Can you imagine this? He's just told his disciples what lies ahead of him. You would think that this would be the moment where the disciples would step up. They would gather around him. They would minister to him. They would support him. They would read scripture to him. They would strengthen him. They would encourage him. And what happens, of course, is exactly the opposite. Peter blows it and rebukes him. Some help. And so, so what does God do? Well, God the Father sends Moses and Elijah to minister to Jesus, just as, by the way, later in the Garden of Gethsemane, Luke tells us that the Father sent an angel to strengthen him. By the way, here's an encouragement. When Satan uses a Peter to tempt you, God will send a Moses or an Elijah to strengthen you. Look for that. When there's someone who stands in your way, and brings great grief and pain to your life. God will send someone else who will be a strength to you, an encouragement, and a support. It's his way, and it's what he does here for his son. Now, the two he sent were Moses and Elijah. I mean, how remarkable is that? Because Moses, of course, had died and been buried 1,400 years before the time of Jesus. And Elijah, of course, had been taken up into heaven 800 years before the time of Jesus. And yet here are the pair of them, as large as life on the mountain of transfiguration, and they are talking with Jesus. Here is something, by the way, very wonderful for all who grieve the loss of a loved one. Those who have died in Christ are very much alive. Amen? Those who have died in Christ are very much alive. And here, Moses and Elijah, who died hundreds of years earlier, are sent by the Father, and they are talking with Jesus. Now, what did they talk about? Well, Luke tells us that they spoke about his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. In other words, a clear reference to all that Jesus would endure at the cross. That's what they spoke to him about. They were ministering to him. They were strengthening him as he prepared himself for the ordeal that lay ahead. He, they were doing what the disciples should have done and clearly did not do. Which you know, it raises this interesting question. What would Moses and Elijah have said to Jesus about his departure? Well, think about this. God gave the law through Moses. And surely the distinct contribution of Moses would be to speak to Jesus about his death in relation to the law. I picture him saying something like this to Jesus. In your life, you have fulfilled all of the law of God that was given through me. 
No one else has ever done this. I couldn't do it, Moses would have said, and Elijah here didn't do it either. You alone, Jesus, know the blessing that comes to those who keep the entire law of God. And now, you are going to bear the curse of sinners who break the law of God. You're going to stand in their place, and the curse that belongs to them will become yours, and the blessing that belongs to you will become theirs. And then, of course, Elijah was known as the greatest of the prophets. And so, I expect that when Elijah spoke to Jesus about what lay ahead, he would have done so, spoken of the death of Jesus in relation uh, to prophecy. Jesus, you are fulfilling all the words spoken by the prophets. They spoke of what you will suffer. Yes, but they also spoke of how you will triumph. Yes, you will go through the darkest valley, but on the other side, you will enter into an inexpressibly glorious joy. You will be exalted to the highest place. The will of God will prosper in your hands. You will redeem an innumerable company of people from every tribe and nation, and the earth will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, and they come to minister to Jesus as he prepares for all that he will endure as he goes to Jerusalem. And Peter and the other disciples hear this ministry that comes from Moses and from Elijah to Jesus and to them. They hear what Jesus will accomplish at the cross when the way ahead of you is hard. Rejoice in the work of Jesus, in the knowledge that He has fulfilled all the law on your behalf, and that all the prophecies of a glorious future will be yours in and through Christ Jesus. What do you do when the way ahead of you is really hard? You look at the glory of Jesus. You rejoice in the work of Jesus. And here's the third thing. You rest in the sufficiency of Jesus. Now, again, try and picture with me what, what happens here. Um, Peter wakes up because he'd been asleep, wakes up, and there's this radiant light that is beaming from Jesus himself, and then he sees Moses and Elijah. By the way, how did he know that they were Moses and Elijah? We're, we're, we're not told. Uh, did Jesus make the introduction? Did uh, Moses and Elijah introduce themselves? Did Peter just know intuitively? We, 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 we don't know. Uh, but he knew that it was Moses and Elijah. Uh, by the way, um, if someone asks you the question, uh, will we know one another in heaven? This is not a bad place to point for an answer. <laughs> it's very clear that these are not two kind of anonymous people. This is Moses and this is Elijah, and they're right there, and they're speaking with Jesus. Resurrection body anticipated. Um, notice what Peter said. He said to Jesus, Lord... It is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And I, I love the fact that Peter clearly has learned from Jesus' rebuke. He calls him Lord, and he says, now, if you wish. So, the presumption that was there earlier that we looked at last week is going away, and he's now submitting himself to what Jesus wants because Jesus is Lord. But he has this suggestion, and 
Look at some detail that I think helps us understand what is happening here. Luke says that as the men, that's Moses and Elijah, were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Uh, Luke adds, uh, by, by the way, usually when you don't know what to say, the best thing is to say absolutely nothing. Um, but that was not Peter's style, and uh, he, he comes out with, with this statement. Now, notice the significant piece that Luke adds to the account here. Peter said this, as the men were parting. So, God sends Moses and Elijah to minister to Jesus and to the disciples, and now God is taking these men away. And Peter doesn't want to let them go. So, hold, hoping that he can hang on to them a little longer, he's saying, let's build three shelters, let's, let's keep Moses and Elijah here. That's what he's saying. Now, that leads to this question. Who is the Moses in your life? Who is the Elijah in your life? Who are the people who to you have been perhaps for a long time gifts of God who have brought strength and comfort and support and blessing? And if God takes one of these people away, you won't want to let them go. Now, every person who walks through the dark valley of bereavement knows what this is like. So, I want you to see from the Scripture what happens next. While Peter was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now, do you see, while he was still speaking, so this is the direct answer of God the Father to Peter's proposal. Peter wants to hold on to Moses. He wants to hold on to Elijah. He wants to continue drawing strength and comfort from these men who have ministered to Jesus and to him. But the Father is taking these men back up into heaven, and the Father is saying to Peter, no, not from these men, but from my son. This is my beloved son. Not these men. This is my beloved son. You must listen to him. What an amazing moment this was. The awesome presence of God in the Bible, you often find this, the awesome presence of Almighty God drawing near in a cloud. And here you have the Almighty speaking from the cloud in an audible voice, just as he did when the law was given at Mount Sinai. And here he says, this is my beloved son. I am well pleased with him. Listen to him. You see what's being said here, Peter? Moses and Elijah have ministered to you. They have brought great help. They have brought great strength. They have brought great comfort to you. But Jesus is infinitely more precious than any Moses or any Elijah. Listen to him. Here is a truth for us to remember when someone is taken and we don't want to let them go. Jesus is the gift of the Father to you. In him you have all that you need. And Jesus will never be taken from you. And that is why it's so significant that in the very last verse of this story, verse 8, we read that they lifted up their eyes and they saw no one but Jesus only. They don't have Moses. They don't have Elijah. But they do have Jesus. And in Jesus they have all that they need. Now, we're looking at what, what you do when the way ahead of you is 
hard. You, you, you look at the glory of Jesus. You rejoice in the work of Jesus, all that he's accomplished for you, fulfilling the law and the prophets. You rest in the sufficiency of Jesus when someone who has been a means of strength and comfort to you is taken away from you. You find your sufficiency in Jesus. This is God's beloved son. You must listen to him. And then the last thing, of course, is that we listen to the words of Jesus. And of course, the words that Jesus spoke on the mountain are in verses 6 and 7, and they're full of significance for us today. When the disciples heard this, that is the voice from the cloud, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, rise and have no fear. Now, notice what happens when the disciples know that they are in the immediate presence of the Almighty. These men see the cloud of God's presence. They hear the audible voice of God, and they fall on their faces in absolute terror. They were terrified. And we would be the same. You know, People sometimes say, when I get to heaven, I've got some questions that I'm going to ask Almighty God. You heard people say that? I promise you it's not going to be like that. Not for any one of us. Don't think for one minute that when you get to heaven, you're going to hold God to account. He's going to hold you and me to account. Read any account in the Bible of a person in the presence of the Almighty, and you will find exactly the same thing. They fell on their faces, and they were terrified. When God drew near to the prophet Habakkuk, he said this, My heart pounds, my lips quiver, my legs tremble. When God drew near to the prophet Malachi, he said this, who can stand when he appears, for he is like a refiner's fire. So, the disciples fall on their faces terrified. And notice the next word in this marvelous verse, but. Thank God for this. Thank God that the verse doesn't end with them falling on their faces terrified. There'd be no hope for us if that was the end. But Jesus came and touched them. Rise and have no fear. Do you see what this is telling us? That Jesus makes it possible for forgiven sinners to stand in the presence of our holy God. And years later, and this is the last thing today, years later, when Peter's an old man and he's getting right to the end of his life, it was this story of the transfiguration that he called to mind when he anticipated his own departure. Let me just read to you from 2 Peter these words of Peter at the end of his life. He says this, I know that the putting off of my body will be soon as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. I, I, I know that I'm not long for this world, he's saying. And I will make every effort so that after my departure... Another way of describing his death, you may be able at any time to recall these things. What things? For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice 
was born to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Now think about this. Peter knows that he's not long for this world. I'll soon be leaving the body and I'll be entering into the presence of God. And of all the stories that he could have called to mind as he anticipates that moment, this is the story that comes to his mind and that gives to him assurance in his own heart as he faces the prospect of his own death. Why this story? Well, because on the mountain of transfiguration, he had already had a taste of what it is to enter the holy presence of the Almighty, and he knew what Jesus would do when that happened. When I put off this body, when I depart from this world, I know exactly what's going to happen. I will enter the holy presence of Almighty God, and Jesus will place his hand upon me. Jesus will say, rise and have no fear, and all will be well. Let's pray together. Father, when it comes to the issues of life and death, we thank you that we have not followed cunningly devised myths or fables. We thank you that you have sent your Son into the world, that he is the Lord of glory, that he has at the cross fulfilled all the law, borne all of its penalty, and that in him every glorious prophecy of Scripture will be marvelously fulfilled. We thank you that even when you take away those who have been a marvelous support and help to us, and we, we don't want to let them go, we thank you that Jesus remains with us and that in him we have all that we need. And Father, we thank you that when the day comes for us, that we will enter into the indescribable glory of your holy presence, that the Lord Jesus will stand with us, that because of him, we have no need to fear, but will be able to enter not into the curse of everlasting lostness, but into the joy of everlasting life. For all this, we give you our thanks and our praise in Jesus' holy name. And everyone who agreed together said,